A reading from the letter of James. Every gracious act of giving with every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. In the fulfillment of his own purpose, he gave us birth by the word of truth, so that we would become a kind of the first fruits of his creatures. You must understand this, my beloved. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger, for your anger does not produce God's righteousness. Therefore, rid yourselves of all sordidness and rank growth of wickedness and welcome with meekness the implanted word that has the power to save your souls. But be, do, but be doers of the word and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. For if there are any hearers of the word and not doers, they are like those who look at themselves in the mirror. For they look at themselves, and on going away, immediately forget what they are like. But those who look into the perfect law, the law of liberty and persevere, being not hear hearers who forget, but doers who act, they will be blessed in their doing. If any think they are religious and do not bridle their tongues but deceive their hearts, their religion is worthless. Religion is that pure and undefiled and undefiled before God, the Father, is this, to care for orphans and widows in distress and to keep oneself unstained by the word, the word of the Lord. Thank you, God. Thus observing the, tra the tradition of the elders, they, and, they, and they did not eat anything from the market unless they washed it. And there are many other traditions that they observe. The washing of cups, pots, and bronze kettles. So the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not live according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? He said to them, Isaiah prophesied rightly about you hypocrites, as it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. You abandon the commandment of God and hold a human tradition. Then he called the crowd again and said to them, listen to me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going in can defile, but the things that come out are what defile. For it is written from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come, fornication, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, folly. All these evil things come from within and they defile a person. The Gospel of the Lord. I will stand at my watch post and station myself on the ramparts. I will keep watch to see what God will say to me and what he will answer concerning my complaints. 
so says the prophet Habakkuk. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. I had another opening for this sermon written. And then I started driving to church. And in that drive, I realized a few things. I am angry. I am disgusted. I have a lot of sorrow and I have a lot of sadness. It's been a rough news week. It may be that you are also here with a lot of things in your own personal life that add to that sense of sorrow or sadness or disgust or anger, and I simply want to name it. We're not going to spend long dwelling on this in the sermon. That's not my point here. My point is to simply name it. And I say that because in a passage from James in which we hear, do not be angry. Anger cannot bring righteousness. I have to deal with the fact that I've been sitting with this text for three weeks, and it was only on the drive to church that I actually said, I'm angry. What kind of denial can do that? Now, as soon as I go to anger, I also recognize fairly quickly that there's a series of questions I ask myself. First of all, I always ask, who is going to benefit from my anger? Someone gets me angry on purpose. Who is going to benefit from that? Who runs multi-million dollar corporations off of the careful cultivation of our anger, right? So I'm constantly needing to ask myself that. And for me, what James is getting at when he talks about the perfect law, to be able to look at a perfect law is to recognize a freedom and a law of liberty. And what that liberty is talking about is the ability to be liberated from that which enslaves us. How often is it that anger is what enslaves us? Carefully cultivated anger that is moving us in a direction that someone else wants us to go. As I said, my other opening for the sermon, totally blown away. But I want to spend some time talking about this letter of James, and I want to do this for a few reasons. First of all, it is my favorite letter within the New Testament. It is my favorite. And that is saying something because I have to preach for a, uh, I have to preach for a living and for a vocation. So I, I don't know how much I'm allowed to have favorites, but I do. All right. So uh, we have passed out of reading Ephesians, the way the lectionary works. It's a three-year cycle of readings. And we read through different letters, basically in order, with a couple of things missing. So you'll notice, if you were to look at your bulletin, it says we are reading from James 1, beginning at verse 17. We have skipped the first 17 verses. Now here's the thing that I'm going to tell you that I always tell you, you should go home and read James. Like I told you to go home and read Ephesians. Now, James is pretty easy to read, I would say. It's 1,745 words. It's five chapters. We have essentially read half of the first chapter in worship. So just have a sense of the timing of that. Go home and read it. And in fact, you can divide it up over the course of the next week be done on Friday, just one chapter a day. It'll give you enough to ruminate on. And one reason I like it is that it is scandalous. It is subversive. It has been maligned throughout Christian history. It's a surprise that it's actually in the Bible. I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. But here's the other thing. I think it's exactly what we need. I think it's exactly what we need. Now, the reason I'm also telling you to read it is because as we go through the lectionary, only certain parts of it are picked out. 
Now, the problem with James is that this starts to look like a lot of finger wagging, okay? It starts to look like a whole bunch of, you should do this, you should do this, why aren't you doing this? And as a result of that, often we get these passages of scripture and these letters that look like they're just finger wagging at us, and it gives us the what without telling us the why. It doesn't tell us the why. And this is the difference between a first order question of morality and a second order question of morality. You can tell me this, but why? Why? Why is this what you're telling me? Why is this the way that we should do things? I'm going to go out on a limb here and I'm going to tell you something that I've told people in private, but I've never actually said in a sermon before. When it comes to the Christian moral tradition, I think the moral tradition sets forth best practices, but it doesn't give you a checklist. It gives you best practices, but it doesn't give you a checklist. What I mean by that is that Christianity sets forth a common vocabulary to talk about ethical issues, but as soon as you turn the faith into a checklist, you have invited judgment rather than conversation, rather than deliberation, rather than being able to come together for the common good and say, what is it we should do? What you instead get is, here's the standard, you have fallen short, goodbye. One way to fix that is to go through the letter and look for the why. What is the why? Now, I mentioned that this letter of James can be subversive, and here's what I mean by that. A Latin American feminist theologian by the name of Elsa Temez once noted that if the letter of James were sent to Christian communities in certain countries that suffer from violence and exploitation, it would very possibly be intercepted by secret governmental security agencies. The document would be branded subversive because of the paragraphs that denounce exploitation by landowners and the carefree life of merchants. And then the passage that affirms that pure religion in the eyes of God our Father is this, coming to help the orphans and the widows when they need it and keeping oneself uncontaminated by the world. Well, that would be reduced to a Marxist reduction of the the gospel. Essentially, it would be said, this this isn't real Christianity. Never mind that you could find it in the Bible. So the community that would receive this letter would become very suspicious to authorities. Now, Temez was speaking in the context of civil unrest and revolution in Latin American countries. The disappearances, the assassinations, the torture chambers, Her point remains. So that's one sort of interception this letter could have had. It's too dangerous to make it to the community it's meant for. But this letter has gone through other interceptions throughout its history. Church authorities were suspicious of this letter up until around 400 AD. 400 years after Christ, they weren't sure if this was going to become scripture. Possibly the reason it was is because we think this was James, the brother of Jesus. And uh, he's brother of Jesus. I think we should put it in, right? It's a sense of, okay, fine. He's family. We'll put it in. Then throughout history, more interceptions happened, more malignment. Luther downplayed this letter substantially. Luther was concerned with how salvation works. Is it by faith or is it by grace is it by works now james is seen as way too focused on works and so there's a definite preference for paul among the reformers luther even goes so far as to say you could read john's gospel in his first letter paul's letters saint peter's letters and that'll show you christ and teach you all that is necessary for salvation even if you never see another book or doctrine. So, James's letter, quote, is really an epistle of straw compared to these others, for it has nothing 
of the nature of the gospel about it. Harsh. This is Martin Luther talking about a book of the Bible, y'all, right? Just throw it out. As a matter of fact, in a, a Bible that Luther compiled, it's still in there, but he took it out of the table of contents. Like, yeah. A letter about the implication of living a holy life loses its importance in a theological debate about things like salvation. But it is the most practical advice on how to live in the midst of a hard reality. This is not the end of the malignment. We've got a few more. Here we go. After the Reformation, around 1800s, uh, up until actually now, but I'm going to say 1940, the historical critical method of biblical criticism came into its own as a style of reading scripture. Now, if you're not familiar with that, that's the idea that we're going to take the Bible just like any other piece of literature, and we're going to look at it and see what we find that way. And a lot of German scholars during this time was like, well, we don't actually think this was written by James. Not only that, Jesus only appears once in it. So what we actually think is this is probably a Jewish letter that was made Christian just by adding Jesus into it and then adding James to it. So I want you to think about Germany. Late 1800s uh, to the early 1900s. It seemed to many of these European scholars that the letter of James is an unchristian letter in the New Testament. And this is the anti Semitism that set the stage for the Holocaust. And as a result of this, naming something as Jewish was a way to dismiss it. Never mind that. Even if this letter doesn't talk about who Jesus is, it is chock full of what Jesus said. Now, James is not only theologically intercepted, it's culturally inconvenient. This is a letter that has, how shall I say this? Well, I think I've already said it. It's inconvenient. The first five verses of the uh, fifth chapter contained the strongest biblical denunciation of wage theft. That is not read in the lectionary. So, this is an inconvenient letter, and reading it can be difficult at times because it asks much of people. So what I want to do a little bit this morning is introduce the letter to you a little bit. And there are three angles I want you to listen for as you read this yourself over the course of the next few weeks and as we hear this in worship. There are three angles to look at. One is suffering born of oppression. The second is hope. And the third is praxis or practice. So with the angle of suffering and oppression, I'll speak more about this next week. But James is writing at a time when Christians are persecuted. And the more cultured despisers of Christianity called Christianity a religion of women and slaves, precisely because of its concern for the poor and its popularity with them. Now, you can imagine if you're in a persecuted community and you find yourself jailed because you're a Christian, what happens to your property? It's forfeit to the state. Who gets it then? Probably someone who's wealthy enough to go to it. So James talks a lot about the wealthy who bring you before tribunals. That might be one way in which he means it. So the point of this is that James is a pastor who notes the reality of the suffering of his people. And there are so many different types of suffering. The angle of hope. The community of believers needs a word of hope, a hope of encouragement, of reassurance concerning the end of injustice, of unrelenting sorrow, of suffering, of poisonous anger. Have you ever come to church 
hoping that the poison could be drawn. With everything that you've seen in a week, that it could be drawn. Might you need such a word now? James will spend a lot of time on the word go in his letter, talking about hope. You can see it in his greeting. He insists on helping the community see a faithful expectation and joy in the face of unrelenting troubles and an end to oppression and suffering and the arrival of the Lord. And the disposition of hope that James wants to uh, cultivate is one of militant patience. Militant patience. I'll talk more about that in a minute. There's then the angle of practice or praxis. James is concentrated in this angle. For James, the denunciation of the present situation and just saying have hope is not enough. It's not enough by itself, but something more is needed. A practice, a way of actually being in the world. And he asks of these Christians who get this letter a practice in which they show a resolute militant patience a consistency between beliefs and words and deeds, a power in prayer, a piercing wisdom, and an unconditional, sincere love among the members of a community who will be learning not to make distinctions of themselves based on wealth. There are nearly 100 imperatives given in this letter the vast majority of them match up to Jesus in his own preaching and in the letters of Paul. So if you find yourself wondering why you should bother with this letter, because maybe Martin Luther was right, this letter is an example of the teaching of Jesus applied to a community life in the laboratory and the crucible of a persecuted community. In it, all of the Beatitudes are echoed, and this letter is an out but working of what it looks like to say, blessed are the persecuted, for you know that, and you are. Blessed are those who mourn, for you do. Blessed are the meek, because you don't know what to do when it feels like you can't do anything. So what do you do? And blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, and that means right relationship with oneself and others and God And then blessed are the merciful, for they learn how to handle oppression and persecution without becoming a combatant. So three angles, suffering, hope, practice. Suffering, hope, practice. Today, I want to focus on hope and practice, because for James, these things are linked. I mentioned earlier militant patience. Now, here's what I mean by that. Usually, the word patience comes to be understood as meaning a passive or submissive attitude, or in my case, it's denial. No, this is fine. It's fine. It's fine. It's not fine. But Often, it's that sense of, I can't do anything, and we freeze. We don't know what to do, and so we wait for others to act upon us, and we think maybe that's the best we can hope for. James is not referring in any way to either denial or waiting for the victimhood that's coming. Instead, he calls for a militant patience, an active and a heroic patience, one that watches for the promising moment the opportune time. It's a patience that keeps us engaged, not shrinking away. There are four Greek terms for patience, all of which are used to refer to patience as a tactic in battle. It's a battle tactic. In warfare, it's not simply go forth, retreat. There's also wait. Wait and see. That's what it means here. 
James is using military terms, and they're used as metaphors referring to the battles of life. And so this posture of patience is one that is always searching for the action of God in the world, for the action that we can do that shows the truth of God's reign. And it's the sort of thing that maybe asks us not what's the direct way to go about things, but what's on the side. What's on the side that can be done? Where's the creativity I'm called to when this looks too big, but there's something I can do? And it tries to answer that question, what do I do when it looks like there's nothing I can do? When there's nothing I can do, what will I do then? So here to be patient means to persevere, to resist, to be constant, to be unbreakable, to be immovable. It's not to wait in helplessness, it's instead of vigil. It's to have vigilance and a vigilance that asks us not to forget what we're waiting for. Don't forget what we're waiting for or what we seek. So with militant patience, with that in mind, listen to this translation of verse 25. The one who looks steadily at the perfect law of freedom and makes that their habit. Not listening and then forgetting, but actively putting it into practice, will be blessed and joyful in all that they do. The one who listens and forgets is the one who forgoes holding vigilance. Yet the one who listens and makes the habit of vigilance may find in their practice that their joy still exists, and that there are wonderful things to be done in the service of a reign beyond our own world, and a hope that does not abandon the one who's willing to keep watch. I will stand at my watch post and station myself on the rampart, and I will keep watch to see what God will say to me. So says the prophet Habakkuk, writing of militant patience in the midst of a different oppression, a different persecution, a different time. For James, hope disciplines the practice. And then the practice confirms the hope. The practice enlivens the hope. The practice shows that the hope of God is not an empty lie, but a promise that finds its fulfillment when we discover our duty can also be our joy. Friends, what do we do in our lives that can confirm God's promises and joy? Have you noticed the ways in which serving God and serving others can confirm a hope within you? Finally, James is so confident in God's victory that he counsels the community to be engaged in joyful, hopeful lives of faith. Engaged, yes, but not by giving themselves to the anger that leads to confrontation. That's why he's going to talk about anger here in chapter 1 and then two weeks from now in chapter 3. The victory is already won. What are we doing in the meantime? This militant patience is the guard that is set over the rest of the virtues. Patience protects from anger, from bitterness. This has happened, now what? This is going on, now what? What can I do? That patient engagement is integral to a vision of what the world can be under God. And James counsels a practice of a community of faith who are learning how to stand vigil and show forth a new pattern for the community and for the world. Now that new pattern will be a story for next week. Amen.